Hello everyone, my name is Shubha Badwe. I'm one of the product managers for Red Hat Advanced Cluster Security. It's a Kubernetes security solution, upstream project StackRocks. So my name is Ross. I was at a company called StackRocks in uh, 2020, which was then acquired by Red Hat. And I've, my main focus has been on the, on the vulnerability scanner that StackRocks offers. And I've also been working on the new and improved version, Scanner v4. And I've also been contributing to Upstream, Claire, and Claire Core. So why are we all here? I think we all are here because security is top of mind for all of us. And most of us, when we are thinking about security, we are also thinking about vulnerabilities, vulnerability management, and vulnerability remediation. So Ross and I, we are here to share some of the things that we have learned in our respective roles that we think you might benefit from. So first, I'll take you behind the scenes of just how vulnerability scanners work. I'll give you an idea of, of what to look for when choosing a scanner as well, and also how you may not be currently be getting all the value you can out of them. And next, I will talk about how to understand what is the real risk that is associated with vulnerabilities and how to use that assessment in prioritizing remediation of those vulnerabilities. It is here I will talk about how context matters, but not all vulnerabilities do. And then to end it, I'll outline the steps your organizations can take to proactively mitigate and manage risk. So let's get started. So we at Red Hat believe in open source and transparency. So the first thing I want to do with everyone is just give you an insight of how do vulnerability scanners work. Uh, we're at Cloud Native Security Con, so my focus is going to be on image scanners. So there are two major components to this. And the first one I'll talk about is image analysis or indexing. So of course, the first thing you're going to need to do is actually just get access to an image. And that'll be either you pull the image from a registry, or you might already have access to the TAR archive. So from there, you're going to want to figure out what is the base operating system. This will be something like Red Hat Enterprise Linux, or RHEL for short, Alpine, Debian, Ubuntu, anything like that. And you'll usually find this in some well-known location like Etsy OS release, Red Hat release, or Etsy Alpine release. So from there, we're going to find all the packages that we can. And we could split this into two subcategories. You'll have OS provided package managers like RPM and dpackage and APK. And you'll use those to download packages. And those will all have metadata stored in some data database that's also going to be in a very well-known location. And then other things that we'll look for is like whatever various languages or applications that we're going to support. So like Java, Go, or an application like .NET Core Runtime. And these will also have some kind of identifier to tell us just what this is and what version it is. So for example, a Java jar will, will have some kind of pom.properties in it or a manifest.mf file, or Go binaries are going to have just some kind of magic bytes in the beginning to tell you that this is, in fact, a Go binary. And then from there, you could figure out what are the dependencies in here. The next step is the vulnerability matching process. So most scanners are going to maintain some kind of local storage of known vulnerabilities, which it's scraped from various sources, which could be like NVD, which is very well known and popular. Or Linux distributions will also have their own feeds, like Red Hat has their own feed, and Debian also has their own feed. And then from there, all we have to do is just take the data that we got from those feeds, the data we got from the analysis step, and then just match them all up. And what we'll end up with is some kind of vulnerability report, like what we see over here. And right here is the result of when I scanned the Kube API server image, the latest one, with the StackRock Scanner v4. So, just a heads up, you're using the latest version. There might be some vulnerabilities in there. So I mentioned like the, the steps that a vulnerability scanner will take. But there's a reason why there are so many out there. They're all going to do many different things. And so let me just tell you about some of the differentiating factors that you should consider when you evaluate them. So the first one, it's pretty obvious, but the support matrix. You know, Not every scanner is going to support every single operating system, and not every one's going to support every single language that you need. So you need to figure out 
does the scanner that I'm looking at, you know, does it support my needs? Or it's even possible that you might need two different scanners. Maybe one's for the operating systems, maybe that's what it specializes in. Another one might be specializing in Go, and maybe you want to use that. And that's okay if you need to use multiple. Another factor is the source of the vulnerability data. So I mentioned before, you're going to have various different sources, and we're going to split that into general purpose ones and Linux distro ones. So the main general purpose one that people are going to know about is going to be something like NVD. And that's probably the most widely used one out there. And it's definitely great if you have compliance needs in your organizations. But then we'll also have Linux distributions. Many of them will have their own feeds. And people who maintain these know exactly how these vulnerabilities are going to be affecting their systems. Uh, sorry about that. And then um, last thing I want to talk about also is just, do you want to know about all the vulnerabilities in your system or just the fixable ones? You know, do you want to have know everything that is possibly wrong, or do you just care about what is immediately actionable, and you just don't really care that much about all that extra potentially noise you might see it as? So what does this look like in practice? So. Just, just from a raise of hands, you know, how many of you actually use a vulnerability scanner? And then how many of you, that's actually a lot, wow, good. How many of you just use one? No one, awesome. So how many of you use multiple? So for those of you who use multiple, something like this may actually look very familiar. So I took this image from a talk that happened last year called Malicious Compliance. And what they did is they created a single image and they scanned it with four different scanners that they all operate about the same exact way, but we clearly have very different results. And for those of you who rose your hand to, to say that you use multiple scanners, you know, is something like this familiar? Pro yes. So when I look at this, I wonder, you know, which one of these can I even trust? Are, are any of them right? Or perhaps are they all right in their own different way? And then, you know, what happens if in the case where maybe one of them says, I have a critical vulnerability, or another one says that, oh, it's not actually critical, it's maybe medium or low, and the others just don't even find it? I, I have no idea what to do, honestly. Like, what, what would you do? And then I haven't even begun to mention that, just take a look at the potential number of vulnerabilities we have from this single image. And I'll just try to th imagine multiplying this to the number of images that you have in your environment. And what you get is something that's Honestly, pretty overwhelming. So what's something that we can do? Well, you may be tempted to think that the fewer vulnerabilities you have, the lower the risk. And though that's not, honestly, it's not completely wrong, but it's also not completely true. So taking a look at this image, this was the final product from that talk last year. They were able to accomplish this by taking that same exact image and just modifying a few things that they knew that would get around how scanners work. So, they got rid of the operating system identifier, Etsy, Alpine release. They got rid of the lib APK, which had all the, the package manager data. They added some sim links, moved some files around. And what they got was essentially the same image, but no vulnerabilities. So they pretty much made the scanners completely ineffective. And what I want to tell you is, Please don't do something like this. Like, we understand the data that you see can be overwhelming, but don't make the mistake that zero vulnerabilities equals zero risk. Because again, it's about the same image, but we had zero vulnerabilities. So I'm going to say this one more time. Zero vulnerabilities does not equal zero risk. I hope you, like, you don't ever feel like you have to cheat the system to get your desired outcome of zero vulnerabilities. And in fact, it shouldn't even be your goal to try to reach this magic number of zero vulnerabilities. It's honestly just not very feasible. And what your goal really should be is just to minimize the risk in your environment. And to talk more about that, I'm going to hand it over to Shuba. Thank you, Ross. So in spite of all the challenges and nuances that surround the vulnerability scanners that Ross just walked us through, a vulnerability scanner is the most essential tool that you are going to use with the daunting task of managing vulnerabilities and remediating. There is no denying that. So say you have picked a scanner or a two for your organization, and now you have scanned 
all the different workloads that you're running, cloud native workloads from your environment, and what are you left with? You're left with this massive list of vulnerabilities, which is typically rep represented by CVE IDs or common vulnerability uh, exposures. Uh, it's a unique ID associated with each public uh, vulnerability. What is the first thing you should do? You should prioritize. You should recognize what is the real risk that is associated with these vulnerabilities and use that assessment to prioritize remediation of those vulnerabilities which have the highest risk associated with them. So how do we do that? There are multiple factors that impact the risk that is associated with vulnerabilities. And we are gonna take a look at those factors one by one, starting with two crucial attributes of a particular CVE or a vulnerability that your scanner has provided you with. And that is the severity rating and the, the CVS score. So the common vulnerability scoring system captures the principal characteristics of a vulnerability, such as the CVE ID, its description, the common weakness enumerator, and it also produces a numerical score that reflects its severity. CVSS is built on three metrics, base, temporal, and environmental. But when most of the vendors are reporting, they're reporting on just the base metric. Even if you take a look at the NVD database, which contains all the vulnerabilities from almost every vendor out there, when they are reporting on the CVSS score, they're also only rep uh, reporting on the base metric. And when I'm talking about the CVSS score, I'm talking specifically about, say, CVSS version 3.1 score. So CVSS is great when you're trying to meet compliance requirements because it provides you that standardized method of assessing severity. And that's what most organizations do. They use CVSS score to meet various regulatory requirements, such as PCI DSS, NIST, HIPAA, or even FedRAM, by showing their adherence to industry best practices. But what we must remember is, CVSS is not a measure of risk. If you read CVSS version 3.1 user guide, it clearly states the CVSS base score should be supplemented with a contextual analysis. And this has been the biggest critic of CVSS version 3.1, that it only takes into account the base metric for risk assessment. So CVSS is not perfect. It's evolving. We are now at CVSS version 4.0. And finally, CVSS 4.1 understands the importance of threat intelligence and environmental metrics, and it takes both of those things into account while generating CVSS score. So in the next year or so, you should expect most of the vendors starting to report on CVSS version 4.0. Now let's take a look at severity. If you again look at the severity rating from NVD database, it's a direct mapping of CVSS scores. Again, the CVSS scores that come from just the base metric. And because of this, some of the vendors who are CVE numbering authorities, including Red Hat, have started producing their vendor-specific CVSC scores and severity ratings. And while generating these vendor-specific CVSC scores and severity ratings, what they are taking into account is what security controls are already built into their software or into their products. And by having the presence of these built-in security controls, the risk that is associated with these products is reduced tremendously. And so let me give you an example. So if you look at the log4j or log4shell vulnerability, which I've had of some sleepless nights, if you look at the entry of that vulnerability in the NVD database, the CVSA score associated with it is 10, and the severity is critical. Now, if you look at the same CVE in the Red Hat CVE database, you will see that the CVSS score is 9.8 and the severity rating is critical. But look further, because Red Hat does assessment of each CVE on per product basis. So the example I'm giving here is OpenShift Logging 
If you look at the severity rating associated with that particular product, it's only moderate. Why is that? And that is because when Red Hat is doing its own assessment, it's looking at the fact that the log for shell library or log for j library, when it gets shipped with OpenShift logging 5.3, it ships as a component of Elasticsearch. And the Elasticsearch components are protected by Java Security Manager. And as a result, they are not susceptible to remote code execution, and hence the impact of moderate. So now you have to ask yourself, who do you consider as the authoritative source, NVD or the vendor? So I would say if you are trying to meet compliance requirements, by all means, use the NVD data. But if you're truly trying to understand what is the risk that is associated with your products and software, look at vendor-specific scores as well, wherever they are possible. So check if your scanners are showing you both data points so you can make those informed decisions. Now let's take a look at uh, the second factor that could impact the risk that is associated with vulnerabilities, and that is presence of the vulnerability in the known exploited vulnerabilities catalog that's published by CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. So if your scanner is flagging a CVE or a number of CVEs saying that there is a known public exploit associated with them, please prioritize those CVEs for remediation. Because no matter what is the associated CVSA score might be or the severity rating might be, just because of the presence of that known exploit, public exploit, that's associated with that vulnerability, the risk associated with that vulnerability is high. So it's a no-brainer. Next, I'm going to talk about two additional factors where context does matter, and that is the type of application and the environment in which that application is running. And when I'm talking about the type of application, I'm talking about whether that application is exposed to internet traffic or is it an application that is internal to your organization that's being just used within your organization. You don't know what external threats or malicious actors are out there on the internet. And so please prioritize remediation of those vulnerabilities for those applications which are exposed to this unknown internet traffic that can, if exploited, do real damage. Same goes for environment. Know where these applications are running in your environment. Are they running in development systems, in test environments, or in production? You definitely want to, again, it's a no-brainer, you want to prioritize remediation of those vulnerabilities which impact your production applications um, or workloads. And that is because if exploited, that is going to do the real damage to your organization's bottom line. And it could also generate some of those headlines that we all want to avoid. So by all means, prioritize that. But don't ignore the internal threats or internal malicious actor, actors either. And that brings, to, brings me to the next point, which is what other um, compensating security controls do you have in place in your organization? I would recommend operating with zero trust principle. And what that means is that trust no one and verify everyone or everything. And so you want to make sure that you have build, deploy, runtime policies. If you're operating in Kubernetes environments, you might want to even suggest your uh, development teams that they can add labels and annotations which can indicate what type of application it is, what environment it is running in, so you can create those policies accordingly for those workloads. You want to make sure you have role-based access control, you have um, intrusion detection systems, so on and so forth. So just follow the industry best practices and put those other compensating security uh, controls in place as well. So now we have looked at all the factors that can impact the risk that is associated with a particular vulnerability. We have now, based on that assessment, decided to prioritize which applications we are going to go after for remediation. The next thing to do is to recognize. Recognize that fixing everything approach is unrealistic. Why is it unrealistic? 
it is because of the sheer number of vulnerabilities you have to manage. It is because not all vulnerabilities are made equal. The vulnerabilities with high severity rating or critical severity rating, expo if exploited, are going to do the most damage to your organization, not the ones with the low or moderate severity rating. Context matters. Know where your application is running, what type of traffic it is exposed to, and what other security controls do you have in place. And importantly, one other point I want to make is not all vulnerabilities matter because not all vulnerabilities get exploited or even will be attempted to exploit it. Let's take a look at some numbers which back up this statement. And this data comes from NVD database and the CISA uh, known vulnerabilities catalog, known exploited vulnerabilities catalog. So the number of CVEs grew at an enormous rate. I think we all are aware of that. The exploitation rate, however, stayed relatively steady. It's pretty low. Less than 1% of known vulnerabilities are ever exploited. This means that the odds of successful exploitation against your organization using a software vulnerability are extremely small. And this is why context matters, but not all vulnerabilities do. Now, let's take a look at the remediation piece. Remediation for cloud native workloads <laughs> looks slightly different than your traditional applications. In case of um, cloud native workload, say if you put a patch in a running container and that container restarted, the patch you had just put in to fix a particular vulnerability, it's lost. So follow best practices. Put the patch or the fix for a vulnerability in the code, rebuild, and redeploy. Now, since new vulnerabilities are detected every day and new vulnerabilities are also reported every day, if you put a manual process in place for remediation, it's just not going to scale. So automate. Automation is the key in managing that vast number or enormous number of CVEs and their remediation. Make use of CI-CD best practices, continuous integration, and continuous delivery. Now, one other thing I also want to emphasize on while we are talking about remediation that Ross touched upon is don't ignore the CVEs where the fix is not yet available. No, understand what is the risk associated with them. Because just because you ignore them doesn't mean the risk goes away. So make sure wherever possible your scanner is also providing, the, providing you the information on vulnerabilities where the fix is not available. This is a um, little bit hard to accept, but accept the risk associated with medium and low severity vulnerabilities. Again, I cannot stress enough that the vulnerabilities with high and critical severity ratings, if exploited, are going to do the most damage, not so much with the medium and low severity ratings. And if you add those additional compensating uh, security controls, then the risk is even lower. So accept it. That's how you are going to be able to manage that enormous list of vulnerabilities from your environment. And last but not the least, prevention. Take a proactive approach to managing risk. And to talk about that, I'm going to hand it off to Ross. Thanks. So after everything we just learned, you know, what are things that you can do to, to mitigate all this risk? So as engineers, what's something you can do? Well, I listed a few things. I definitely did not list them all, but I'm just going to highlight some of these things that you see right here. The first thing you see is upgrade the base images as frequently as possible. Now, we understand some, you know, some companies have certain regulations. They can't update things as fast as they possibly want, but just whenever you get the chance, you want to. And that's because new versions will tend to come with these security patches, and you're going to want them. And even though we already mentioned that zero vulnerabilities isn't quite the goal, 
you still do want to minimize the number of vulnerabilities as you'd still want to minimize the potential exposure to risk that you have. Please use operating system provided package managers because we already talked about this is exactly what vulnerability scanners use. You know, we know scanners aren't perfect. There are ways you could get around it. We talked about it before, but that's why we wanted to tell you how scanners work so you know exactly how to get the most value out of them. And these scanners, a lot of them require reading the, the package manager's database to figure out what exactly you have so they can best help you. Another thing I want to mention is just use well-maintained and trusted open source libraries. So I imagine most, if not all of you, have heard by now about what happened with the XZ library earlier this year. We don't want that to happen again. And you don't want to be exposed to that. So make sure when you choose a library, just make it something that you can see that is well-maintained and it's backed by trusted maintainers. Last thing I'll talk about is just delete what you don't need. This also will just minimize the potential exposure in your environment. So when you're done with the package manager, remove it. Just as I mentioned, don't, maybe don't remove the database because the scanners might need that. If you don't need something like curl or wget, remove that as well. But also be sure to not remove some of these things while the container is running because a lot of these, can, these image scanners, well, they're image scanners. They're not container scanners. So they can only tell you what they see in a static image and not what's going on in a running container. And you know, uh, a good thing that you might want to try to do is just use some kind of minimal base image, so like a UBI, a UBI minimal or micro, or Google has this concept of distro list. And that will just try to give you, you know, something that you can use but only has what you need. So what can a SecOps team do to minimize risk? Well, first thing is, <coughs> sorry, encourage your developers to embrace the best practices that we pretty much just talked about. And I understand you probably are very sick of hearing this, but seriously, like the shift left approach to security is the way to go. You want to be able to detect vulnerabilities and act upon them as soon as possible. So you know, maybe uh, you can use a tool that has the ability to detect these things right from the developer's IDEs, or maybe just giving them access to the scanner that they could use on their own personal computer. Another thing is that there should be different security gates throughout each process of the development pipeline. So that'll include like developing, building, deploying, all the way to runtime. And there should be gates and policies around these that should be enforced to make sure that when vulnerabilities should be detected and they should be addressed at all those different stages. And then, of course, when your application is actually deployed, don't stop there. Shuba already mentioned there are new vulnerabilities that come out every day, and scanners are always updating with the latest vulnerability data every day. Make sure you're also checking your running applications, too, for the latest vulnerabilities. And you'll definitely want to fix these from code and not from the running container. As we just mentioned, your scanners probably won't be able to detect that. And plus, it may not be as re reproducible. So stick with updating it from code. One other thing I want to talk about is that you know we really just talked about vulnerabilities with associated CVEs. But there are just so many different ways that you can be exposed to risk. You know, so you definitely also want to have some kind of solution that could check what else is going on in my runtime. So, I want to see what are all the what's the network activity that's going on? Or am I making connection to things? Or are things making connections to me that I'm not expecting? Or are there some kind of anomalous processes that just started to 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 run? And you'll want to find a security solution that offers this as well. You know, a lot of us use image vulnerability scanners, but that's not the only thing. And there are a lot of solutions that offer more than just the vulnerability scanners. So, if you do find a solution that offers you a lot more and all these things, you should use them. So at the end of the day, we have a choice. We can either try to remediate every single known vulnerability or try to strike some kind of balance. You know, trying to, to fix everything it takes a lot of time, money, effort, energy. And we want to f try to find a balance between patching software and also being able to have some more innovation and just taking proactive prevention steps that we talked about. So if we have some time, we're very happy to answer any questions you have. Or if not, I actually don't know how we're doing on time. Um, we'll be upstairs at the Red Hat booth. Thank you. Thank you.